Chapter Four of the Jewel of Seven Stars. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Jewel of Seven Stars by Bram Stoker. Chapter Four, the Second Attempt. The sight which met my eyes had the horror of a dream within a dream, with the certainty of reality added. The room was as I had seen it last, except that the shadowy look had gone in the glare of the many lights, and every article in it stood stark and solidly real. By the empty bed sat Nurse Kennedy, as my eyes had last seen her, sitting bolt upright in the armchair beside the bed. She had placed a pillow behind her, so that her back might be erect, but her neck was fixed as that of one in a cataleptic trance. She was, to all intents and purposes, turned into stone. There was no special expression on her face, no fear, no horror, nothing such as might be expected of one in such a condition. Her open eyes showed neither wonder nor interest. She was simply a negative existence, warm, breathing, placid, but absolutely unconscious of the world around her. The bedclothes were disarranged, as though the patient had been drawn from under them without throwing them back. The corner of the upper sheet hung upon the floor. Close by it lay one of the bandages with which the doctor had dressed the wounded wrist. Another and another lay further along the floor, as though forming a clue to where the sick man now lay. This was almost exactly where he had been found on the previous night, under the great safe. Again the left arm lay toward the safe. But there had been a new outrage, an attempt had been made to sever the arm close to the bangle which held the tiny key. A heavy cookery knife, one of the leaf-shaped knives which the Gurkhas and others of the hill tribes of India use with such effect, had been taken from its place on the wall and with it the attempt had been made. It was manifest that just at the moment of striking the blow had been arrested, for only the point of the knife, and not the edge of the blade, had struck the flesh. As it was, the outer side of the arm had been cut to the bone, and the blood was pouring out. In addition, the former wound in front of the arm had been cut or torn about terribly, one of the cuts seemed to jet out blood as if with each pulsation of the heart. By the side of her father knelt Miss Trelawney, her white nightdress stained with the blood in which she knelt. In the middle of the room Sergeant Daw, in his shirt and trousers and stocking feet, was putting fresh cartridges into his revolver in a dazed, mechanical kind of way. His eyes were red and heavy, and he seemed only half awake, and less than half conscious of what was going on around him. Several servants, bearing lights of various kinds, were clustered round the doorway. As I rose from my chair and came forward, Miss Trelawney raised her eyes toward me. When she saw me, she shrieked and started to her feet, pointing towards me. Never shall I forget the strange picture she made, with her white drapery all smeared with blood, which, as she rose from the pool, ran in streaks toward her bare feet. I believe that I had only been asleep, that whatever influence had worked on Mr. Trelawney and Nurse Kennedy, and in less degree on Sergeant Daw, had not touched me. The respirator had been of some service, though it had not kept off the tragedy whose dire evidences were before me. I can understand now, I could understand even then, the fright, added to that which had gone before, which my appearance must have evoked. I had still on the respirator, which covered mouth and nose. My hair had been tossed in my sleep. Coming suddenly forward, thus enwrapped and dishelved, in that horrified crowd, I must have had, in the strange mixture of lights, an extraordinary and terrifying appearance. It was well that I recognized all this in time to avert another catastrophe, for the half-dazed, mechanically acting detective put in the cartridges, 
and had raised his revolver to shoot at me when I succeeded in wrenching off the respirator and shouting to him to hold his hand. In this also he acted mechanically. The red, half-awake eyes had not in them even then the intention of conscious action. The danger, however, was averted. The relief of the situation, strangely enough, came in a simple fashion. Mrs. Grant, seeing that her young mistress had on only her nightdress, had gone to fetch a dressing-gown which she now threw over her. This simple act brought us all back to the region of fact. With a long breath, one and all seemed to devote themselves to the most pressing matter before us, that of staunching the flow of blood from the arm of the wounded man. Even as the thought of action came, I rejoiced, for the bleeding was very proof that Mr. Trelawney still lived. Last night's lesson was not thrown away. More than one of those present knew now what to do in such an emergency, and within a few seconds willing hands were at work on a tourniquet. A man was at once dispatched for the doctor, and several of the servants disappeared to make themselves respectable. We lifted Mr. Trelawney onto the sofa where he had lain yesterday, and having done what we could for him, turned our attention to the nurse. In all the turmoil she had not stirred. She sat there as before, erect and rigid, breathing softly and naturally and with a placid smile. As it was manifestly of no use to attempt anything with her till the doctor had come, we began to think of the general situation. Mrs. Grant had by this time taken her mistress away and changed her clothes, for she was back presently in a dressing-gown and slippers, and with the traces of blood removed from her hands. She was now much calmer, though she trembled sadly, and her face was ghastly white. When she had looked at her father's wrist, I holding the tourniquet, she turned her eyes round the room, resting them now and again on each one of us present in turn, but seeming to find no comfort. It was so apparent to me that she did not know where to begin or whom to trust that, to reassure her, I said, "'I am all right now. I was only asleep.' Her voice had a gulp in it as she said in a low voice, "'Asleep! You! And my father in danger? I thought you were on the watch!' I felt the sting of justice in the reproach but I really wanted to help her, so I answered. Only asleep. It is bad enough, I know, but there is something more than an only round us here. Had it not been that I took a definite precaution, I might have been like the nurse there. She turned her eyes swiftly on the weird figure, sitting grimly upright like a painted statue, and then her face softened. With the action of habitual courtesy, she said, Forgive me, I did not mean to be rude, but I am in such distress and fear that I hardly know what I am saying. Oh, it is dreadful! I fear for fresh trouble and horror and mystery every moment. This cut me to the very heart, and out of the heart's fullness I spoke. Don't give me a thought. I don't deserve it. I was on guard, and yet I slept. All that I can say is that I didn't mean to, and I tried to avoid it, but it was over me before I knew it. Anyhow, it is done now, and can't be undone. Probably some day we may understand it all, but now let us try to get at some idea of what has happened. Tell me what you remember. The effort to recollect seemed to stimulate her. She became calmer as she spoke. I was asleep and woke suddenly with the same horrible feeling on me that father was in great and immediate danger. I jumped up and ran, just as I was, into his room. It was nearly pitch dark, but as I opened the door there was light enough to see father's nightdress as he lay on the floor under the safe, just as on that first awful night. Then I think I must have gone mad for a moment. She stopped and shuddered. 
my eyes lit on Sergeant Daw, still fiddling in an aimless way with the revolver. Mindful of my work with the tourniquet, I said calmly, "'Now tell us, Sergeant Daw, what did you fire at?' The policeman seemed to pull himself together with the habit of obedience. Looking around at the servants remaining in the room, he said with that air of importance which, I take it, is the regulation attitude of an official of the law before strangers, "'Don't you think, sir, that we can allow the servants to go away? We can then better go into the matter.' I nodded approval. The servants took the hint and withdrew, though unwillingly, the last one closing the door behind him. Then the detective went on. "'I think I had better tell you my impressions, sir, rather than recount my actions. That is, so far as I can remember them.' There was a mortified deference now in his manner, which probably arose from his consciousness of the awkward position in which he found himself. I went to sleep half-dressed, as I am now, with a revolver under my pillow. It was the last thing I remember thinking of. I do not know how long I slept. I had turned off the electric light, and it was quite dark. I thought I heard a scream, but I can't be sure, for I felt thick-headed, as a man does when he is called too soon after an extra-long stretch of work. Not that such was the case this time. Anyhow, my thoughts flew to the pistol. I took it out and ran on to the landing. Then I heard a sort of scream, or rather a call for help, and ran into this room. The room was dark, for the lamp beside the nurse was out, and the only light was that from the landing, coming through the open door. Miss Trelawney was kneeling on the floor beside her father and was screaming. I thought I saw something move between me and the window, so without thinking and being half-dazed and only half-awake, I shot at it. It moved a little more to the right, between the windows, and I shot again. Then you came up out of the big chair with all that muffling on your face. It seemed to me, being, as I say, half-dazed and half-awake, I know, sir, you will take this into account, as if it had been you being in the same direction as the thing I had fired at. And so I was about to fire again when you pulled off the wrap. Here I asked him. I was cross-examining now and felt at home. You say you thought I was the thing you fired at? What thing? The man scratched his head but made no reply. Come, sir, I said. What thing? What was it like? The answer came in a low voice. I don't know, sir. I thought there was something, but what it was, or what it was like, I haven't the faintest notion. I suppose it was because I had been thinking of the pistol before I went to sleep, and because when I came in here I was half-dazed and only half-awake, which I hope you will in future, sir, always remember. He clung to that formula of excuse as though it were his sheet anchor. I did not want to antagonize the man. On the contrary, I wanted to have him with us. Besides, I had on me at that time myself the shadow of my own default. So I said as kindly as I knew how, "'Quite right, Sergeant. Your impulse was correct. Though, of course, in the half-somnolent condition in which you were, and perhaps partly affected by the same influence, whatever it may be, which made me sleep and which has put the nurse in that cataleptic trance, it could not be expected that you would pause to weigh matters. But now, whilst the matter is fresh, let me see exactly where you stood and where I sat. We shall be able to trace the course of your bullets." The prospect of action and the exercise of his habitual skill seemed to brace him at once. He seemed a different man as he set about his work. I asked Mrs. Grant to hold the tourniquet, and went and stood where he had stood and looked where, in the darkness, he had pointed. I could not but notice the mechanical exactness of his mind 
as when he showed me where he had stood, or drew, as a matter of course, the revolver from his pistol pocket and pointed with it. The chair from which I had risen still stood in its place. Then I asked him to point with his hand only, as I wished to move in the track of his shot. Just behind my chair, and a little back of it, stood a high Buell cabinet. The glass door was shattered. I asked, "'Was this the direction of your first shot or your second? The answer came promptly. "'The second. The first was over there.' He turned a little to the left, more toward the wall where the great safe stood, and pointed. I followed the direction of his hand and came to the low table whereon rested, amongst other curios, the mummy of the cat which had raised Silvio's ire. I got a candle and easily found the mark of the bullet. It had broken a little glass vase and a taza of black basalt, exquisitely engraved with hieroglyphics, the graven lines being filled with some faint green cement and the whole thing being polished to an equal surface. The bullet, flattened against the wall, lay on the table. I then went to the broken cabinet. It was evidently a receptacle for valuable curios, for in it were some great scarabs of gold, agate, green jasper, amethyst, lapis lazuli, opal, granite, and blue-green china. None of these things, happily, were touched. The bullet had gone through the back of the cabinet, but no other damage, save the shattering of the glass, had been done. I could not but notice the strange arrangement of the curios on the shelf of the cabinet. All the scarabs, rings, amulets, etc., were arranged in an uneven oval round an exquisitely carved golden miniature figure of a hawk-headed god crowned with a disc and plumes. I did not wait to look further at present, for my attention was demanded by more pressing things, but I determined to make a more minute examination when I should have time. It was evident that some of the strange Egyptian smell clung to these old curios. Through the broken glass came an added whiff of spice and gum and bitumen, almost stronger than those I had already noticed as coming from others in the room. All this had really taken but a few minutes. I was surprised when my eye met, through the chinks between the dark window blinds and the window cases, the brighter light of the coming dawn. When I went back to the sofa and took the tourniquet from Mrs. Grant, she went over and pulled up the blinds. It would be hard to imagine anything more ghastly than the appearance of the room with the faint gray light of early morning coming in upon it. As the windows faced north, any light that came was a fixed gray light without any of the rosy possibility of dawn which comes in the eastern quarter of heaven. The electric lights seemed dull and yet glaring, and every shadow was of a hard intensity. There was nothing of morning freshness, nothing of the softness of night. All was hard and cold and inexpressibly dreary. The face of the senseless man on the sofa seemed of a ghastly yellow, and the nurse's face had taken a suggestion of green from the shade of the lamp near her. Only Miss Trelawney's face looked white, and it was of a pallor which made my heart ache. It looked as if nothing on God's earth could ever again bring back to it the color of life and happiness. It was a relief to us all when Dr. Winchester came in, breathless with running. He only asked one question. "'Can anyone tell me anything of how this wound was gotten?' On seeing the head shake which went round us under his glance, he said no more but applied himself to his surgical work. For an instant he looked up at the nurse sitting so still, but then bent himself to his task, a grave frown contracting his brows. It was not till the arteries were tied and the wounds completely dressed that he spoke again, 
except, of course, when he had asked for anything to be handed to him or to be done for him. When Mr. Trelawney's wounds had been thoroughly cared for, he said to Miss Trelawney, "'What about Nurse Kennedy?' She answered at once, "'I really do not know. I found her when I came into the room at half-past two o'clock, sitting exactly as she does now. We have not moved her or changed her position. She has not wakened since. Even Sergeant Dawes' pistol shots did not disturb her. "'Pistol shots! Have you then discovered any cause for this new outrage?' The rest were silent, so I answered, "'We have discovered nothing. I was in the room watching with the nurse. Earlier in the evening I fancied that the mummy smells were making me drowsy, so I went out and got a respirator. I had it on when I came on duty, but it did not keep me from going to sleep. I awoke to see the room full of people, that is, Miss Trelawney and Sergeant Daw, being only half awake and still stupefied by the same scent or influence which had affected us, fancied that he saw something moving through the shadowy darkness of the room and fired twice. When I rose out of my chair, with my face swathed in the respirator, he took me for the cause of the trouble. Naturally enough, he was about to fire again when I was fortunately in time to manifest my identity. Mr. Trelawney was lying beside the safe, just as he was found last night, and was bleeding profusely from the new wound in his wrist. We lifted him on the sofa and made a tourniquet. That is, literally and absolutely, all that any of us know as yet. We have not touched the knife, which you see lies close by the pool of blood. Look, I said, going over and lifting it. The point is red with the blood which has dried. Dr. Winchester stood quite still a few minutes before speaking. Then the doings of this night are quite as mysterious as those of last night. Quite, I answered. He said nothing in reply, but turning to Miss Trelawney, said, We had better take Nurse Kennedy into another room. I suppose there is nothing to prevent it? Nothing. Please, Mrs. Grant, see that Nurse Kennedy's room is ready, and ask two of the men to come and carry her in. Mrs. Grant went out immediately, and in a few minutes came back, saying, The room is quite ready, and the men are here. By her direction, two footmen came into the room, and, lifting up the rigid body of Nurse Kennedy under the supervision of the doctor, carried her out of the room. Miss Trelawney remained with me in the sick chamber, and Mrs. Grant went with the doctor into the nurse's room. When we were alone, Miss Trelawney came over to me, and taking both my hands in hers, said, "'I hope you won't remember what I said. I did not mean it, and I was distraught.' I did not make reply, but I held her hands and kissed them. There are different ways of kissing a lady's hands. This way was intended as homage and respect, and it was accepted as such in the high-bred, dignified way which marked Miss Trelawney's bearing and every movement. I went over to the sofa and looked down at the senseless man. The dawn had come much nearer in the last few minutes, and there was something of the clearness of day in the light. As I looked at the stern, cold, set face, now as white as a marble monument in the pale gray light, I could not but feel that there was some deep mystery beyond all that had happened within the last twenty-six hours. Those beetling brows screened some massive purpose. That high, broad forehead held some finished train of reasoning, which the broad chin and massive jaw would help to carry into effect. As I looked and wondered, there began to steal over me again that phase of wandering thought which had last night heralded the approach of sleep. I resisted it and held myself sternly to the present. This was easier to do when Miss Trelawney came close to me, and, leaning her forehead against my shoulder, began to cry silently. 
Then all the manhood in me woke, and to present purpose. It was of little use trying to speak, words were inadequate to thought. But we understood each other. She did not draw away when I put arm protectingly over her shoulder as I used to do with my little sister long ago when in her childish trouble she would come to her big brother to be comforted. That very act or attitude of protection made me more resolute in my purpose, and seemed to clear my brain of idle, dreamy wandering in thought. With an instinct of greater protection, however, I took away my arm as I heard the doctor's footstep outside the door. When Dr. Winchester came in, he looked intently at the patient before speaking. His brows were set, and his mouth was a thin, hard line. Presently he said, "'There is much in common between the sleep of your father and Nurse Kennedy. Whatever influence has brought it about has probably worked the same way in both cases. In Kennedy's case, the coma is less marked. I cannot but feel, however, that with her we may be able to do more and more quickly than with this patient, as our hands are not tied. I have placed her in a draft, and already she shows some signs, though very faint ones, of ordinary unconsciousness. The rigidity of her limbs is less, and her skin seems more sensitive, or perhaps I should say less sensitive, to pain. How is it, then, I asked, that Mr. Trelawney is still in this state of insensibility, and yet, so far as we know, his body has not had such rigidity at all? That I cannot answer. The problem is one which we may solve in a few hours, or it may need a few days. But it will be a useful lesson in diagnosis to us all, and perhaps to many and many others after us. Who knows? he added, with the genuine fire of an enthusiast. As the morning wore on, he flitted perpetually between the two rooms, watching anxiously over both patients. He made Mrs. Grant remain with the nurse, but either Miss Trelawney or I, generally both of us, remained with the wounded man. We each managed, however, to get bathed and dressed. The doctor and Mrs. Grant remained with Mr. Trelawney whilst we had breakfast. Sergeant Daw went off to report at Scotland Yard the progress of the night, and then to the local station to arrange for the coming of his comrade right, as fixed with Superintendent Dolan. When he returned, I could not but think that he had been hauled over the coals for shooting in a sick room, or perhaps for shooting at all without certain and proper cause. His remark to me enlightened me in the matter. A good character is worth something, sir, in spite of what some of them say. See, I've still got leave to carry my revolver. That day was a long and anxious one. Toward nightfall, Nurse Kennedy so far improved that the rigidity of her limbs entirely disappeared. She still breathed quietly and regularly, but the fixed expression of her face, though it was a calm enough expression, gave place to fallen eyelids and the negative look of sleep. Dr. Winchester had, towards evening, brought two more nurses, one of whom was to remain with Nurse Kennedy, and the other to share in the watching with Miss Trelawney, who had insisted on remaining up herself. She had, in order to prepare for the duty, slept for several hours in the afternoon. We had all taken counsel together, and had arranged thus for the watching in Mr. Trelawney's room. Mrs. Grant was to remain beside the patient till twelve, when Miss Trelawney would relieve her. The new nurse was to sit in Miss Trelawney's room, and to visit the sick chamber each quarter of an hour. The doctor would remain till twelve, when I was to relieve him. One or other of the detectives was to remain within hail of the room all night, and to pay periodical visits to see that all was well. 
Thus the watchers would be watched, and the possibility of such events as last night, when the watchers were both overcome, would be avoided. When the sun set, a strange and grave anxiety fell on all of us, and in our separate ways we prepared for the vigil. Dr. Winchester had evidently been thinking of my respirator, for he told me he would go out and get one. Indeed, he took to the idea so kindly that I persuaded Miss Trelawney also to have one which she could put on when her time for watching came. And so the night drew on. End of chapter 4 Recording by Roger Moline